All right. So I'm actually going to come at this uh, discussion that we've been having. Jay, you need to run presenter mode. Otherwise, we see PowerPoint. I need and to run it in tab mode? Presentation mode. Oh, yeah, it was in presentation mode. I must have selected the wrong thing. Here. Oh, yeah. Then you have selected PowerPoint, not the presenting window, which is different, apparently. OK, yes. Oh, I see. OK, um, share application screen. And let me do entire screen and try that. And then come back to this one and hit that. Is that better? Is that better? Oh, I think so. OK, all right. So I'm, I'm coming at things from a little bit of a different angle, because um, a lot of what we've been talking about today has been looking at different kinds of storage interfaces, particularly for new kinds of devices. And for me, I'm coming at it more from the um, how do we make these machines adapt to how the users work rather than how to expose the different hardware to the users and then make them adapt. So in that sense, um, the persistent memory has been something like NVDIMMs or the new Optane devices from Intel have been something that has shifted um, kind of the opportunities that we have. So that's what I was going to go through here and look at some of the, the changes that I see that are potential and what kinds of things we might be able to do and the advantages we could get out of them. So um, I work in the same kind of area as all of you do, so I'll pretty well skip this slide here. So the, the question that were driving me was, can persistent memory better support compute operations or storage operations? And in that sense is really the, the question of the title of this talk was, is it really memory or is it storage? And that's something that um, I'm going to explore here. And um, there are trade-offs, obviously, in terms of cost and capacity and um, programming interface and um, the byte accessibility versus block accessibility and other things like that. So. Um, those things are um, important to all consider. So as far as what I see in terms of the history of what we've been looking at, say, for the last 15 or 20 years or so, is um, we really have had this modern computing environment where we had disk and tape for a long time. And that's kind of driven how everything we've looked at. Um, I think it was John Thomas earlier today was pointing out that when we moved away from disk, we uh, shifted from uh, having this big latency based off the device to being based off the software stack. And I think that's actually been something we've been dealing with for um, uh, ever since the, the initial flash devices came about. Um, I know that um, as the Audios 2.0 library was being developed, that was the one bit of advice I gave Oak Ridge was, um, make sure that everything that you're doing is not relying on having disk latencies to be able to um, do particular kinds of opti optimizations and operations because all of those latencies are gone. We're now in an era where um, we're essentially network optimization programmers where a few machine instructions removed from our stack is something that's actually considered a, a significant win because of the amount of additional throughput we can get. And that's really changing the way we ought to think about things. Uh, and the, the big change uh, as far as what we deal with is that the quad level cell flash is essentially the same price as disk. Um, it's slightly more expensive, uh, but the reality is, is that we don't really care about the endurance just based off of the life of the machines. There's enough endurance even on those relatively low quality devices that we can um, get enough life out of them and the performance is just so much better. So uh, the, uh, the other thing to look at is that we've had this additional piece that I know we at Sandia and at DOE are looking at is how much high bandwidth on package memory can we get? And what we've been looking at is um, currently we really can't afford as much as we'd like. And because of that, we can't quite fit the entire computation into the on-package memory. 
And what that means then is that we're still going to have to have some additional spill space that's relatively fast uh, for that computation to be able to have its complete data set on node. And uh, persistent memory is something that really can fit well into this environment. And that's one of the areas where uh, people like Intel are kind of pushing for it to fit is that here's this high capacity, lower price for capacity memory um, that's slightly lower performance, but you can use it to get additional capacity um, so that you can have this uh, trade-off on the, the high bandwidth memory. Uh, so, um, the other piece that we look at is that um, SATA is essentially at this point a dead interface. If, if it's not NVMe, we're generally not too interested. Uh, the numbers I remember seeing a couple of years ago is that it was like 10 times faster to go across InfiniBand than it was to go across a SATA interface to a device, even to a flash-based device. And at that point, uh, that's not a useful hardware interface for us anymore. Uh, the only problem with NVMe is it's still an expensive interface so uh, we have to be uh, somewhat aware of how much we're buying because we still do have budgets. And that leads us to this memory versus storage setup where um, at the end of the memory, in other words, the slowest part of the memory or the fastest part of storage, we really have something that's potentially gonna sit on the memory bus. And that's where persistent memory could fit in. And the question is, is that on these machines is how do we allocate it? And um, to go through that, one of the things I wanted to go through next is to look at how is something considered storage? If we're using a device, no matter what its actual physical characteristics are, if we're using it as storage, what are some of the assumptions that we make? And I have those listed out here. Um, the, the biggest one for me really came down to is that um, there's some assumption that the data that is pushed onto that device is going to be read by some arbitrary third party later, and therefore we need to encode some of the uh, information necessary to understand that within the data. So in other words, you have that metadata uh, encoding with the data. So that would be any of your standard file formats, HDF, NetCDF, um, audios, um, or um, it could be like the ECMWF, format does. And that's actually the special case that I'll bring up repeatedly through here because they've thrown a monkey wrench in the middle of all of these uh, thoughts that I've had. And, but if it uses memory, the thing that we've always focused on is how do we get the um, most amount of data into a cache line as possible? And because of that, we strip out everything that we don't need to understand or manipulate the data. And that gets us the best data density so that we can get the most throughput through our computation. And that's generally how people uh, treat some sort of memory device. Um, so if we have persistent memory as a device, is that really slow memory or is it fast storage? Um, does persistence matter? And um, if it's across a fast interconnect, does that matter? And what about byte addressability? And we'll go through all these questions here. So if we're organizing data for highest density, that's pretty much a memory operation. Um, but if we're putting it into an archive or a long-term reuse format, then that's probably more of a storage uh, operation. If we're writing a checkpoint to disk using raw memory dump, that's actually more of a memory operation, even though it's writing to disk. And that's again, because we're not encoding any of that additional information. We're assuming that whoever is going to read that data later knows exactly how to interpret that bit pattern into something useful. And uh, as Tiago has mentioned many times over the last few years is that um, they're using uh, essentially the on disk format for all the computation. And that actually is something that transcends both that memory or storage. It really kind of says that everything's really storage rather than memory. And um, it gives ECMFWF a lot of advantages for um, their ability to manipulate data and what they have to do as they're moving data around and gives uh, some optimizations there. And the performance penalty of less data density is not high enough to matter. So that's uh, actually an interesting case that um, we may have to have more application people look at in the future. 
So as far as the applications people go, they look at these devices and they say, that's slow memory. It's something I can swap to because it's got a byte address. I have CPU instructions that can access it. Um, this is great. And um, they'll look at that and say, I'm going to do some out of core computations with it. This is something that will work well for me. Um, I'll use some uh, simple programming interface to essentially just copy memory blocks around and everything will be great. As far as the storage people, we come at this and look at it and say, oh, that's a really fast storage device because of the persistence property. And we say, that's great. We can extend our storage hierarchy into this area. We can do some automatic data migration, both up and down the stack based on uh, either caching or pre-staging or just um, doing flushes later as we run out of space. We see this as a great device to be able to make our storage stacks extend further into the node. But the question is, is that why do we have big machines? And the reality is, is we have big machines to get the best amount of computation done. It's not to have the best storage performance. And all of the things that we do needs to focus around how do we serve the needs of the computational community, not the needs of us as storage people and our personal interests. Uh, that's my opinion on this. And because of that, um, we need to figure out since the applications people and the storage people see these devices as different, uh, maybe we can think about using them in a more flexible way. And um, there's a lot of different things that we can potentially do. So um, data lifetimes I think are interesting. The architectural assumptions, I think, are pretty well standardized now. Uh, they're probably going to be in a dim sort of format on the memory bus or something similar. Uh, the speed differences, I don't think, matter that much. And the data encoding might be meaningful, but I think uh, we have a trailblazer that's trying to say, no, it doesn't matter. Go with something that works well for long-term use instead. So. Uh, the applications people, if you really ask them, what would you prefer if you could have any sort of interface to write data to storage, what would you like? They'd say, I want a mem copy because it's trivial for them to implement and they know exactly what they're going to do. And the question is, is how do we make something like that work for a long-term storage kind of environment? Uh, one of the, the, the tools that Sandia has come up with over the last several years that they're working into the C++ standard is uh, COCOS. And the idea there is you have different computational um, tools or devices, and you also have different memory contexts. And anytime you want to use a memory context with a computational device, there is an API call you have to make to, quote, transfer the data from one memory context to a different one. If the devices use the same memory itself physically, that's a no-op, but otherwise it will actually do the transfer, transfer between one kind of memory or storage and another for you automatically. And it's a consistent programming interface no matter what the, de the devices are behind the scenes. And that gives us a, a bit of convenience uh, for us to be able to think about these devices in a different way. Um, one of the things that I know in talking with storage people comes up often is, what about this, this byte to block translation? And is that meaningful? And as far as I'm concerned, no, it's not. Because um, you're always going to read a cache line at a time, and we still treat it as a byte interface. And when you read something from disk, you're going to read a block at a time, but you're still the original C uh, APIs for POSIX, they're still a byte level interface, even though they're reading a block at a time. And so I don't think that there's really that much that is significant about the difference between a byte and a block. It's just a matter of what interface we choose to expose to people. The biggest problem that we're running into, though, is that right now Intel is the only person with a real production product. Um, we saw earlier that ARM is starting to look at potentially offering products that will be able to play in this space. But we really need really broad support before we can say, hey, this persistent memory is something that we can do and use everywhere. Um, the other things that I want to be able to look at is um, if we're going to um, uh, deal with these machines, we want to be able to have that persistent memory device be a flexible device so that um, if we are scheduling a compute intensive job, job, it can get allocated as either entirely or, or primarily spillover space for memory. But if we're doing something that's IO intensive, like a machine learning or some other data analytics, we're probably going to want to 
um, allocate that as primarily an on-node storage that we can pre-stage in to get better throughput. And so that's kind of kind of a scheduler change that we'll need to make, be able to reallocate how the nodes look, and there won't be a, a necessarily a a single consistent look. So we'll end up with kind of a hybrid machine out of it. And I think that is less problematic than um, having a devices that we hard lock into one form or another. And um, kind of the motivating factor, I mentioned this earlier, is that the high bandwidth memory is just a little too expensive still. And once we get that um, down, then I'm not sure that we'll ever use persistent memory for extra me or extra compute memory. It would probably end up getting used more for storage. So um, the motivation for me on this is looking at um, DOE is, but we've been told that once we hit an exascale machine, we will not be allowed to have um, compute oriented clusters versus um, analysis oriented clusters anymore. We're going to have to have a single machine that can do everything. And because of that, we really need this flexible hardware to address the architectural expectations that are different between the two compute models. And that's where I see this coming in as something that um, can really uh, bridge the gap between the two and give us a flexible machine that can address both. But we're really going to have to lobby the CPU manufacturers because uh, DOE is adamant about having at least two companies that are able to give a bid for a particular kind of product uh, before we're really willing to buy it. We will, for example, like Sandia did with the Astra machine, um, buy a very large machine of a particular new architecture as an experiment, but we don't won't do anything in production um, until we have um, broader availability in the market. So um, that was my talk. Let me get back over here to the comments so I can see what's going on there and stop sharing. Thanks, yeah. Um, where is the stop sharing? Share <laughs> none. That's very interesting. There's a button at the bottom, right? To unshare somewhere? Unshare uh, so oh, no, not that one. For me, it was top right. Top right. Oh. Share blank whiteboard. How about that? That works. Yeah, that, that worked well. You yep. can actually draw on it. So thanks um, for questions from on comments from the audience. Yeah, I couldn't see the comments as they were going. OK, I have one comment then. Yeah. Which I can hear. Um, so when you mentioned you know, the, the idea to have the different um, machine architectures, right? I believe yeah. um, when we look also at John Thomas' results where he showed the latency, the impact of the latency, and when we have NVMe, right? Every kind right. of, everything costs something. So the question right. is, do we want to afford um, to convert while we are writing the data? Do we want to afford, you know, generating some machine non-native format, right? Right, and that's that's where I think Tiago's group with ECMWF really comes and gives us a, a path forward. Is not only have they demonstrated that they can use one format for everything, um, they've shown that they can do that with performance and at scale. And um, I think that's actually what our long-term direction or something like that that we can look at doing, because doing conversions is costly and slow. And if we can find ways to avoid doing the conversions, um, I think we're much better off. Yeah. And, and that, I mean, what I think, right, in that sense, say, is yeah. you, you have put on, you had put this discussion, you know, is this blurring between is it memory or is it storage, right? I would yeah. actually add one more thing for me is what is long term storage and right. archiving, right? Because that is something. Um, that is maybe really something different where you have to have, you know, the, the proper machine architecture and you have to, you know, be able to read it and so on and so forth, but it's low performance. Right. Yeah. And, and well, it doesn't have to be low performance. It's just not, doesn't have to be close to compute. Yeah. Yeah. Well, fair enough. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it has different characteristics, let's say in terms of right. latency and, and so on. Um, so maybe, um, the, the storage uh, in that sense it will become 
everything that is now online storage will become, you know, will blur together, like you said. Yeah. And then there remains the long-term archive. Yeah. And you no know, platform ag agnostic for formats for exchanging data. Yeah, I can see us going to um, say high bandwidth memory on package and then like persistent memory on the nodes. Um, NVMe, I'm not sure price performance where that's going to really fall compared to persistent memory in the long term. And that's really, I think, going to be the dividing line is, is it enough better price performance than persistent memory to make it a usable device still? Um, but I can see us still having uh, something uh, like that as a shared scratch storage and then having a uh, disk behind that as a large medium term storage data lake kind of thing. But um, uh, where that dividing line is and, and how it's going to float, that's like burst buffers. I'm still from the first day they were proposed. I said, this is a transitional technology until flash is cheap enough. And that's proving out true at this point that um, people looking at using burst buffers architecturally, they say this is too much effort for us to have to deal with when we can now afford enough flash and get the performance that we, the burst buffers would have given us without having to deal with an extra tier. Because that's gone through all of the, um, uh, the NNSA, so the Lawrence Livermore, uh, Sandia, Los Alamos, uh, big machine acquisitions. That's been one of the things that we put in our uh, request for proposals is um, reduce the number of tiers if possible while meeting our performance metrics. And the responses that we get from the vendors are very much a, we can meet your performance requirements and your budget using these kinds of flash devices. And you've now eliminated the need to have a burst buffer and a disk tier. So, um, that's that's the 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 shifts that um, we see going on. Hmm. Okay, I thought uh, I was just going to say that's interesting because in the UK we've just got a um, uh, a big new crate as our as our UK national resource with a burst buffer on it. So no, yeah. obviously no one told either no one told Cray or no one told the UK government to pay as much as the uh, American government to get the system. Well, yeah, it, it's a, yeah, it, it's definitely a budget thing. Um, and Cray is attempting to milk as much uh, return of its investment as it can. Uh, and, and that may be the place where bus buff, burst buffers still live is on more budget conscious users. Um, DOE certainly has enormous budgets. There's no question about that. But um, we still are budget constrained. That is. A, still a true statement so because um, if we weren't budget constrained at all then we would do things like we would have plenty of on node hbm and never need anything else and we would have had all flash many many years ago but those were things that they the said HBM, budgetarily no sure but the hbm is, not, is different right because you need a, a manufacturer to build a processor with the hbm on it you know, right you but we would pay them to chip line. yeah yeah but i mean there's budget constrained and there's rolling your own uh, line of processes, which is right, I think, right. Like two ends of the spectrum, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, this is these are the things that make it. Uh, I think it's more interesting on the storage environment now is that um, we're we're moving to an environment where that line between storage and memory and what the programming models are is shifting. The things that we used to be able to do we really can't afford to do because the devices are too fast, so to speak. And those, these are new opportunities I see for us as a community to um, really address this uh, shifting landscape rather than saying, how can I um, optimize my current model that I've been using for the last 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 years uh, because the, the underlying assumptions are changing. So I think we have a, a real opportunity to do some things that I know many, if not all of us, uh, have thought about is like, if I could just do a clean state slate design for this, I could do so many really neat things. And I think we're at a, a point where the technology is shifting enough that we can kind of get away with that. So I'm encouraging everybody, please, let's let's do some wild and crazy things because we have the opportunity and we have the motivation in terms of the hardware.
Alright, further comments? 